All right, hello, welcome to Sound Sagas, another episode for you. We are here with an interview. Uh, we have a special guest here, Chris Pennant. Uh, my name, Andrew, of course, and of course we have Will. Yep, and uh, Chris is a former Jewel and Osco employee, uh, avid walker, uh, chicken tender enthusiast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'll pass the mic to you. Uh, why are we here today? Oh, well, not to talk about the chicken tenders, unfortunately, <laughs> because I think that's really important. There was somebody who went around a while back and tried to find the best tacos in the city, which I still want to do, but there's a, there's a space to find the best chicken tenders in the studio, in the city. But when you think of Ska, Will, um, what's the first thing you think of? Don't say chicken tenders. Uh, <laughs> now that's all right. you have. It's all in your head. Uh, brass instruments, skanking, uh, I mean, I could go on, but that's kind of no, like, what's straight your, where what's my head. What's your experience? Because I, it's it's about experiences in the music as much as the music itself, right? Totally. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd say one of my seminal experiences was I I was really into that band Real Big Fish. Mm -hmm. um, went to a lot of their shows, and one of the best shows I ever went to was one of their shows, and my car got towed. And that was like the first like real life. Welcome to ska, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it felt that way because I uh, I was deciding at the show. I was like, my car is probably going to get towed. Should I go fix this or should I stay here? And I decided to stay there. Were you enough into Real Big Fish where it was like that didn't matter? That's what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. wild. Yeah, man. and my dad got mad at me, but I was like, yeah, it was You're a like, great real show. Big fish. Whatever. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> yeah. Man, that's actually really cool. Yeah, and then I later on got into the more classic like specials and scatolites and stuff like that. Is that what what era was this in your life? Uh, real big fish, like oh, that show was two thousand five. Okay, did this get you into like did ska get you into like perhaps like punkier or like more dynamic? Music? I think it was yeah. a gateway music yeah. into more punk and hardcore stuff too. Yeah, cool, cool. It's okay. interesting. Yeah. Well, that's it's. I had a kind of a, a, a culture clash between the two, because so my my dad was Jamaican. He didn't stick around in longer than I think I was uh, one. Mm. But I found out. But my mom told me a lot about him, and she had music that he liked, she liked, they both liked uh, recordings of them singing this this stuff in the you know a, a recorder like a microphone at home. Oh wow. So. Uh, I, I eventually, as I, as my life went on, I got into some of this music, but when I was in high school, I was at St. Ignatius and I played trombone from grade school up through high school, up through college, up past that. And my good friend, Danny Lopaka, shout out to Danny, still a great musician in his own right, um, graduated from the UIC music program. He was in oh, this nice. Celtic rock band in my freshman year when I met him. And I thought this kid was the coolest. He knows he's not cool. He thinks he is, but he knows he's not. <laughs> but he was he was different. He was wearing like flat Irish caps and and um, had punk rock patches all over his jacket. And I wanted to be in this band like the more than anything that I had, that I had done to that point. And he was like, "Well, there's no trump. There's no trombones in a Celtic rock band, as I'm sure you <laughs> could both guess." But he wanted to do something. Um, not just with me, I think he just wanted to do this band as, as well. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, well, let's make a ska band. And I was like, oh yeah, I know ska. I was like, cause I had seen Good Burger and Le I knew Love, Love Less Than Jake and Real Big Fish, Mustard Plug, Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. Cause my other friend, Chris Curtis from grade school went to Jones and that was where he, that was where he jumped off. Cause he played trumpet in grade school and I played trombone. Mm -hmm. So we went our separate ways, he found um, his group over there, and they formed this band called Random Outburst, and it was like third wave to the hilt, like ska punk, ska core, voodoo glow skulls, streetlight manifesto, like hard hitting, like like that, like that fast. And Man. so when I came to Dan with that, he's like, no, we're gonna do like ska, like he called it ska. He was like basically saying like the other stuff was not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe more traditional than like third wave, like yeah, yeah, just like really going back. And I he he made me a tape. Um, I don't remember every single thing on it, but there was this um, recording from like the seventies. I think nobody still nobody really knows who made it. Mm -hmm. It was either the Clash and the Jam, or one or the other, or you know a mix of guys from those two groups. 
there's just this instrumental track, instrumental track called Rudy Ska. And it's really nice, really smooth. Saxophone, trumpet, trombone, like a trombone solo on it. Um, there was that. There was the um, a Message to You Rudy was on it. Uh, I think a Scottalites track was on it. So you basically, this was like my crash course. And it was funny because some of this stuff was familiar, but I didn't know why. And the so, sound is like Seminole Scott to you? Like, it's like, that is it? Yeah, well, it's like, that's what it was. And then as I got more deeply into it, as we played our, as we started playing our, our music and our sound, it became like really this first wave ska, almost like rock steady reggae in some respects. Mm -hmm. I learned more about, oh, this is where this music that I already liked comes from. Because mm -hmm. we had a Bob Marley CD at home. We had a uh, Peter Tosh album at home because this was the stuff my mom and my dad listened to. Right. So it was finding out that, but also finding out, okay, what is this music? I like this music. I want to know more about it. And so that clashed with what the presentation was in media, which was pretty much... Oh, Ska, that horrible, annoying music from the 90s where everybody <laughs> dresses up in a certain way and yeah. plays a trumpet loudly in your face. I, um, I watch this show still called uh, Legend of Tomorrow that's on the CW, part of uh, DC's uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, TV shows. And they make a Ska joke, I think, in the fourth or fifth season. And it's not uncommon for yeah, shows yeah. to still crack those jokes. Yeah, it is kind of weird how that's like a punchy down thing that is in multiple medias because i've definitely heard that joke before too yeah, it does. and it's weird too because yeah the third wave stuff like less than jake is still pulling huge crowds mm -hmm. like they just did a tour last year yeah no i heard about that and i i kind of wanted to go hello rockville still one of my favorite albums yeah it's not i like music with horns because i came up playing jazz and mm -hmm. band music mm -hmm. so i like scott that has horns in it and not a lot of less than jake has horns in it i think once they really hit their stride but I still really love that album. It's just a lot of fun. And yeah. I think that's the big thing about these different styles of ska. And so why it's annoying. When I hear people say that, when I hear people make that joke, yeah. like, oh, ska's annoying. I'm like, well, listen to this. Or, well, more succinctly, I want to, like, hit them <laughs> so that they can be more receptive to me telling them to listen to something. Because yeah, that's yeah. really right. how that I works. think it's it, part of the people who say that, I think they're just... They're obviously pigeonholing the whole genre. You're saying the whole genre is much more dynamic than you keep. I mean, you might hate one thing you hear that might be ska, but there's like all different types, right? Like if you hate one ska band, that doesn't mean you're gonna hate another. So I think there's people they just they just think what ska might is in their head, and yeah, yeah they don't really realize that there's much more to it. Like yeah. I don't know where that picture came from. Mm -hmm. If it was like they had interactions with people at shows or at mm -hmm. um, clubs or bars or whatever. Or have this idea of, of people wearing fedoras and and skinny ties or what? Because yeah. right. even that was um, a uniform for people who liked this music. Mm -hmm. But those people who wore that uniform would kick the shit out of you. Like that was the whole <laughs> thing about Rude Boys. Yeah, it was punk music, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like it, it, whether it was in Jamaica or whether it was in London or wherever Sheffield or wherever you didn't mess with those guys <laughs> like right. they were listening to this music like laid back rock steady kind of you know pick it up put it down music but they would jump you if mm -hmm. not just throw the ones with you and knock you out so i don't know where that perception came from if it was like a retaliation like oh we're, we don't like getting jumped by guys with fedoras <laughs> and, and uh creepers and ben yeah, sherman yeah. on yeah. i find that the styles of music that invite like uniform or like self-presentation or identity that is definitely like countercultural or against the grain, like looking different. Like those styles of music tend to sometimes get punched at a little bit more. Yeah. Which makes sense because yeah. like the, the people I know who like metal are definitely like I, There's I, definitely I a uniform. with some of those yep. people in yep. high school too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like the goth metal kids. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole idea is like you're, it's like any kind of, of grouping, right? Mm -hmm. You want to get with people so you're in larger numbers and you want to like appear, you're, you're doing it for safety. So you want to look a little bit tougher. Yeah, and so yeah. the goth metal kids look hella tough. And I met with, I met them and, and rolled with a lot of them. And they were like, a lot of them were very shy. Yeah. yeah. Very like low key people and introverted. And this was their like way to be out. Right. Right. This was their right. way to like be extroverted and be kind of out in the, 
in the culture when they felt like really comfortable. My my guy is like that. He's a mm-hmm. very shy, low key guy, and I've seen clips of him singing in his band. Nice, completely different. Nice. Right. It's it's amazing how people can find that outlet, right? Especially through music and, and identity, right? Yeah. I wanted to ask you, like, did ska when you were like getting into it or your foray into it, did that help develop your personal identity or help you connect with family ties or history or anything like that? Not necessarily with like my my family in Jamaica. Okay. Um, I haven't talked to them in a, in a little while, mm-hmm. but I think with that identity that was with my dad specifically, mm-hmm. it helped connect with that because a lot of that went into like he was a cricket fan mm. because West Indies cricket in the in the sixties and seventies when he was coming of age saw its um, ascension into right. world popularity, mm-hmm. and a lot of that was tied to. Ska, rock, steady, then reggae, really like roots, yep. reggae stuff. For me, I remember going to see um, Midwest Ska Fest before um, the same Chris Curtis and a lot of the people that I knew from Jones pretty much took it and ran with it a few years ago because what it was when we were young um, kind of folded. And he's like, well, we want to keep doing this. So I remember my mom drove me and I was like, this is what I'm going to wear. And she's like, you can't wear that. It's it's November. You're going to freeze. <laughs> so I was wearing a white dress shirt, black suspenders. I had these clunky, ru- clunky rubber sole dress shoes mm-hmm. that she made me wear. I really wanted to wear my Chuck Taylors. And she was like, you can't wear that. There's ice on the <laughs> ground and, and slush. And, you but you were, you were in uniform. Yes, I was. But then I was definitely in my element. Mm-hmm. I was in my element. And... I think the way that the music goes, no matter where, it, where if it's first wave or third wave, the whole point is that you're dancing. Mm. And so it integrated a lot of what I already knew from growing up on the South Side, going to school where I did, where footwork and juke music is such a part of Chicago. Mm-hmm that I was already like, this is what we did at parties. We danced, like we danced hard and mm-hmm. we danced fast. And so going to the show, which again, is not necessarily the sky that I came on to talk about primarily, but the outgrowth of it, mm-hmm. we danced hard and we danced fast and we danced long. So you just, kept, you went, you went, you went, you went, you as hard as you could, mm-hmm. you tried to keep up, keep up with everybody. It's definitely music of movement. Yes. Like, yeah. Big time, yeah. yeah. And that's what I really connected with. Gotcha. That's what I've always connected with about ska. It's like you move, whether you're on stage and you're playing, and, and you guys have played in bands, you know that you have to keep your energy up and know oh, yeah. when and where to conserve and when and where to really hit and go for it. Yeah, but in ska, I feel like it, it, you hit that level and then you just keep trying to go higher. It's it's wild for that because that's a lot of it, but it feels so much like the jazz I played in college, especially when we had the crowd on our side. Mm-hmm. Bradley jazz concerts were a lot of fun because the crowd that came was an assortment of people, not least because some of the people that were in the band like me, um, the guy Jonathan Day, who's from South the South Suburbs, who played saxophone. We knew the black students at a predominantly white school, and we had a few other people in the band who were in the same boat. So those kids came out to support us because not only they, they liked the music, they felt like it was important. And I don't think I recognized that as much at the time, mm-hmm. but like seeing guys from my floor that we we blocked our floor in sophomore year, and then they came out to our jazz show and I was like, damn, this is cool. So that mm-hmm. was there was that assorted movement there where they were in an auditorium, but you could see people wanting to or getting out of their seats when we played a song that was like, okay, it's time for you to move. And I think that was different for what we had had then at that school. Mm. And so ska was a lot of that baseline for me that came from years before because this is the music I heard. And even when we played in um, this group that Danny and I made with um, our guy Jim Cata, the Back Alley Skanks. Mm. Long live <laughs> the, the Back Alley Skanks. <laughs> Oh my God. But that was our whole, our basis. We had our fast songs, we had our slow songs, mm-hmm. we had our get up songs, we had our, you know, listen, we had our high school introspective songs. I will not tell you any of the names of these songs <laughs> on this show. I bet they're pretty juicy. Oh <laughs> yeah. man. You know, those guys have, are married and have kids now. <laughs> And I, I don't want to ruin their reputations as, as family men. I mean, one interesting note on that, though, not 
that aspect in particular, but since Scott is such a defined music style or like has such a feel to it, oh, I see a lot of covers in that zone. Like a lot of people just redoing songs in that style mm. that are huge. Um, but I kind of wanted to touch back on what you said about it being a safe space and like it, such a unique like experience because that's kind of what brought, drew me into it was like, it was a very, like you knew who was into it. Everyone who went to those shows was all about it. I like, I, I mean, I have checkerboard bands and like a hat mm -hmm. and I felt kind of silly if I wore that to school, but if I wore it to the show, I knew right, people, other, right. other people would be dressed like that. Some of these musical spaces seem to have like clear, more defined boundaries than others. Like it's not just like soft rock or yeah. contemporary music. Like if you're in the sky and you're at a ska show, you can pretty much guess the type of dress you're going to see and the type of person you're going to kind of interact with. But at the same I, yeah. time, like, since it's such a high energy, fun dance, mm -hmm. like if you like to move and you like music, they can kind of have a good time there. Low, lower barrier to entry, for instance, maybe then like yeah, something lower like, barrier to entry yeah, and yeah. just a fun style of music. Right, like right. It, it was very fun. Like mm. the funny thing is, I think that is really similar to where ska started from mm -hmm. because I know we're we're kind of getting not ahead of ourselves, but it it shares a lot of similarities with the like development of the musical style in itself because in the Caribbean, I mean, primarily in Jamaica, so it was Mento and Calypso. And it was a lot of like combinations of African and European rhythms that meshed and melded. But then out of that came like the 40s and 50s R&B from the US, which was a lot of New Orleans mm. boogie woogie before doo-wop. Like a lot of early mm -hmm. ska stuff is really similar to a lot of 1950s doo-wop like when you think of frankie lyman yeah and the um the teenagers that you had alton ellis and i think the flames like it was like james james brown started with the famous flames right mm -hmm. but it also was a lot of really similar stuff to that very popular dancing music like for kids right i mean it's like people like young people their jamaica was moving toward independence um colonialism was reaching its like nadir and so there was this, and it was the post-war, uh, post-World War II. So yeah, there was this <laughs> kind of like expansion of, okay, well, we want to celebrate. We're out of the war. We're out of, we're coming out of colonialism. We're getting a bigger voice. And there was this expansion of like dance, not dance hall in its sense that we know it now, but like dancing on, on in places, on places, on the mm -hmm. corner, in the streets sound systems that came up where it was literally like we got all this stuff in a van we're gonna take the party here and you get out you got the speakers you have all these guys in the, in the system who are djing and here's the party and we're gonna create the party it was like a block party in a mobile setting mm -hmm. and that's where this is all kind of created and it wasn't necessarily a safe space for you know people to come that's everybody to come out but it's like you knew where the party was and that's where you went and that was kind of the nascent beginnings of ska. It was like, here's where you go, where you, where you hear the music that you want to hear, that uh -huh. they're not necessarily playing on the radio. That's where the kind of the safe space right. comes in. It's like, where do you go to get this music? You know you want to hear it. Where do you go to get it? Right. And it's like, okay, such and such. Like Duke Reed has a sound system. He's going here. Cox and Dada has a sound system. He's going here. Prince Buster's sound system's going here. Um, Dicky Dicky Wong sound systems going here, and that's where you went. Like small island, but all these different places in Kingston where people were coming out of out of like the rural settings out of the farms to go kind of see where they could mm -hmm. seek their fortune. And it was like, well, you put in a 40, 50 hour week. Now what? Time to party. Yeah, yeah let's go. <laughs> Sounds like at least back then and there, like it was a combination of bigger factors that all kind of came in like from technology like the ability to have remote audio and like mm -hmm. get your stereo out or boom boxes and stuff and then you had the uh the like you said like the the the, the decline or the bottoming out of of uh of like of like external rule of the country for instance right and then you have all these factors that come together and then it creates this almost like hotbed or, or like the fertile soil for this to to generate and start and it's the people who actually go and do that like yeah, yeah. When you, when you mentioned soft rock, it's, I don't know necessarily the basis for it, for 
I know the music, right? But mm. I don't know the underlying factors. Yeah. But a lot of these different styles, there's a lot of similarities I see between ska and hip hop, which okay. is, makes a lot of sense because hip hop wouldn't have been possible without ska to a, to a certain degree, as much as it owes to funk, it owes a lot to ska, reggae, because that style of like talking over a record, that's where reggae and, mm -hmm. and toasting and then hip hop came from. Like the first mm -hmm. Cool Herc was Jamaican. So there's this something in the sound, whether it's from the horns, whether it's from the beat or what, when you're talking about movement, it was speaking to people on this way. And then in the lyrics, it was talking about individuality and kind of a sense of consciousness and self in that melting pot of, you know, post-colonialism, post-war, um, expression, like moving to the city and kind of maybe being on your own for the first mm -hmm. time. Yeah, And so that's where a lot of this really fleshed into and so when i know we're, we're not done right but when people say oh you know that that bastard probably even likes ska <laughs> i'm like what are you talking about like <laughs> this is a very integral idea not just to me but kicked off a lot of things that you like like right. without that basis like so many where, we, where we went exist. to, like dub and dance hall. Well, Drake wouldn't have a career, first and foremost. <laughs> like, that, <Got> it. <laughs> <laughs> like Drake in Toronto had so, owes a lot to the Caribbean people that moved up there. But when, like, uh, what was, uh, when he had that track with Rihanna and Hotline Bling and all that, mm -hmm. that's so Caribbean I dub say, dance hall. You can almost put right. that in the same category. Mm. Even like, this is one of my favorite albums. Tana Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, brand, um, that same old mistakes, mm -hmm. a lot of influences there too. Even though there's, you know, you think of horns when you think of Sky and there's not necessarily horns on that, mm -hmm. but that heavy kind of offbeat, there's so much that ties into it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You and can I, even, like, I guess in a more contemporary way with Ska, like, replace the horns with keyboard. Yeah. Synth and, like, get the same sort of... Oh, yeah, yeah that's like... Yeah. And I actually... Shop and ranks, all yeah. that stuff, that's what they do. Yeah. Through that whole history, too, it just made me think, like, I mean, a lot of music is like this, but Ska in particular, it always seems to have had one step in the past and one in the future, you know? Yeah. Because it's so accessible. You, yeah. If you play a horn, you can get me in a band, but you can also play guitar and be in a band. Or yeah. if you're, you know, re using a synth or whatever, that'll mm -hmm. fit in too. Like hip hop also has that kind of trend where it's like every time there's new tech stuff, I feel like hip hop is the first thing oh, to do it. Dude, yeah. But ska just has that such like longevity too, which again blows my mind when you say like people are making fun of people just on the street because I'm like this music has not only been around for a long time, mm -hmm. it's come into the mainstream three huge times and countless others. It's almost hard to even conceptualize why people like have a thing against ska. Not to say that like, <clears throat> like ska hate is like a big thing. Like not, I can't, I can't yeah, imagine. I feel like we're like yeah. talking about, we don't want to pick it, pick it. No, no, it's not about. just the ska, man. <laughs> but we have noticed in our personal lives and just dealing with that, people kind of like, like if they're going to talk trash about something, it's usually country or ska or yeah. something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. And I'm like, you, but you're right. You're like, if you look in the sky, even if you just read the Wikipedia on it, you'll realize like there is so much dynamics and so much time and culture and history and everything that goes into it. And you, yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess the sound just kind of like hits some people. It's like some people don't like jazz, you know, like, yeah, like, I, I, which I find weird. But <laughs> I think I, I, um, I remember talking to somebody and I think he said he didn't like, it wasn't that he didn't like jazz. He didn't like the reaction that he got when he said he wasn't into jazz mm. from people, mm. which, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's some elitism there, I guess, too. That goes with that. I mean, I, I come from heavy metal. It's like the king of elite. Elite, <laughs> yeah. elite mofos who just like think everything they love is the best thing in the world. Uh, clearly not true. <laughs> no, it's an interesting yeah. It's an interesting thing. And I think there's we're talking about like barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. And ska is, like I'll talk to people about like we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell them, it's like, hey, this is where this came from. This is what it is. And like, if you think about X group or X group or X group, a lot of what they like was influenced by this sound. But even more, you know, central than that, like it was a lot of, it started out as a lot of protest music. Uh, well, it started, it really started out as more of like 
kind of doo-wop, like we said, boogie-woogie romance music. Mm -hmm. And then when it started moving into rock steady and, and reggae, really, because Bob, the Whalers started out as a ska group. Right. Then they moved into reggae. It moved into that protest music. And when it got to two-tone and got to the UK and got big again, a lot of it was protests against like the 80s and Thatcherism mm. and um, like deregulation and all of that. So... I, yeah. I was just reading something that there was a there's a group in the UK, oh Captain Ska, that's what they're called. And it's like just a group of freelance musicians. So there's never one specific person who's on every record, uh -huh. but mainly what they do is put out protest records. So pre uh, pre Brexit, like the David Cameron coalition government, they wrote a protest song about that. Then they wrote another one and another one and another one and they just kept it going. Yeah. And that's been their their MO and their delivery vehicle is this because, you know, as much as people might want to make fun of it, something about the music and the rhythms and the melody speaks to people in a very, I think, visceral way. Yeah, well, I guess the maybe the word for that is like, a, I don't want to say rage against the machine, but like, but it's that sort of there's something you're saying what you're saying is there's something about the music that inspires like, like something in you to go against the grain or to to speak out against something or to feel empowered to say what you believe in the face of adversity or let's say like like i don't know overarching governments or bad politicians whatever like i guess the question is like is there something inherent at least for you about ska that like gives you that maybe it's the physicality of it maybe it's the movement of it some of it's yeah. like having played it and yeah. knowing that you're usually you you're literally using your wind like the breath in your body to play it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've liked about nice. being about it myself. But I think it, if you think about it like that, you're breathing in and out when you're moving and there's something where it just kind of, I think there's that idea of, of, of what Marley said about get up, stand up that is still inherent in mm -hmm. that music. There's, there's Judge Dredd and Judge Dredd dance. And the Judge Dredd dance is this a judge just handing out sentences and so there was this idea of not being rude boys as that was coming into vogue like as more people moved to the city like kingston which kingston's pretty much the city like there's montego yeah so we're talking Palmer. strictly jamaica yeah, right, in right jamaica, now yeah, yeah this is before before it moved over to um uk and london mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, you want to be rude, boys? It's like, it's like well, you get 30 days? And it's like, I didn't do this, judge. He's like, hush up. You know, you're going to jail. But it's one of my favorites because uh, it's, it's talking about something that, you know, real life. This is not something that actually happened, but it's an expression of reality mm, right. um, in song. So it was recognizable for people. They knew what it was because they'd either been a part of it or seen it happen. And it wasn't necessarily that they were like, oh, well, this is song is telling me not to get into trouble. Some people were probably took it as like, yeah, that's the anthem. You know, it's like, you know, that was me. I was in front of the, I was in front of the Bailey last week, something like that. Mm -hmm. But I like that song and that's what really pulled me on the uh, Prince Buster. And then um, Don Drummond is unheralded for a good reason, uh, the short story about Don Drummond is that with the Scottalites, who everybody knows from like Guns of Navarone, he was the trombonist with that band. And they were um, student session musicians, pretty much. So if, they, if, if Studio One brought in somebody to sing and they wanted like horns in the back, like the Scottalites would be the session musicians. So... Mm -hmm. There's all these names associated with the Scottalites, like Tommy McCook and Laurel Aitken, who did move to England and lived there for pretty much the rest of his life. But Don Drummond was the trombonist, and he was very prolific in a very short amount of time. It's like if you look up on YouTube, you'll find a lot of Don Drummond tracks. Um, and were they sessioning for mostly ska music or kind of anything? Mainly, mainly ska. I mm -hmm. think they hit on some rock steady, but this is like that doo wop kind of boogie ska that we talked yeah. about. Yeah, it was just hugely we popular. They were just pumping yeah. out records. Like as it moved towards reggae, that's when you get to Desmond Decker more so, mm -hmm. and um, 
like Bob Marley and the Wailers and Alton Ellis, who when you talk about people doing covers before, yeah. a lot of the stuff they did was like, Covers of UK of songs from the US or the or other places that were doing like that kind of it like they would do covers of songs like Blue Moon. Um Alton Ellis did a cover of Sitting in the Park by I can't remember the artist's name I but it's like an old doo wop favorite. Like if you yeah. if you go on YouTube and you look up like lowrider anthems, like the stuff that was coming out of LA in the eighties. That's a lot of what they covered in the 50s and 60s. I mean, it's funny too, because I mean, we were talking about this earlier, but just how many artists from whatever style of music have a history of those standards? Like, it, I mean, it all started mm -hmm. with jazz, but like everybody is kind of playing a standard, even if they don't know it at a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a familiarity, right? It's literally yeah. the same song, it's yeah. just different iterations mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, like these songs are like it's timeless, um, where it just keeps going and going and going. I think part of it was that there was an allowance for it because I, I was as I was reading, there was a certain law that wasn't on the books in Jamaica at the time, so you could just record another song without paying any royalties to the original mm -hmm. artist or requesting um, clearance to cover it. Kind of like when we're talking about hip hop, kind of like how early hip hop was with sampling, like you sampled. When you get away with it and then you didn't tell anybody who you sampled it from and you didn't release like oh we got it from this record and crate digging became that mm -hmm. it was like guys went over to the u.s heard heard songs on the radio while they were working um i think so either derek morgan or cox and dodd that i mentioned before the, he went to the u.s worked for a while heard this stuff and was like inspired and he bought a turntable a few vinyl records and some other equipment came back to jamaica had studied carpentry and so he built his own sound system mm. with the stuff that he got and that was what they and what they were playing at first was stuff from the u.s like they would get these records and play these records then they would have somebody record these records a new version of the same song then they started writing original stuff and that's how you got people like prince buster and laurel aiken who became famous for singing these for singing this music and so going to Don Drummond, like he and the Scottalites were not unique, but they were some of the names that really became big and stayed big in the early first wave for just doing instrumental stuff that was more bombastic, more jazz, like I mean they were just very good musicians. Yeah. Like they played they played, you know, jazz and bebop and Mm -hmm. kind of orchestral jazz from like the 30s and 40s they grew up they came up playing that and so then they were playing this music that was very much ska like this became what i knew as first wave ska mm -hmm. but it was sometimes just instrumental and don drummond in like a three four year period put out so many of these tracks like ska town if you look up ska town they'll have this all on this playlist but ska town is one of my favorites and this is hard driving just Really, really good song. It lasts mm -hmm. like two minutes and 25 seconds. And that's actually something, not to totally interrupt, but that turned me on to Scott in the beginning too, is that all these guys are just really good musicians too. Right. That's why they can pop out all these covers. That's why they can play all these arrangements without having to write it down. Because um, I come from a band background too. Like I played French horn and trumpet and tuba. Oh, yeah. You played uh, French horn? Yeah, yeah. I honestly didn't know that. Yeah. Because so, you didn't seem extra pretentious. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, but no, I... I French horn was interesting because you could play all these other instruments by learning those fingerings. Mm. Oh, and it was kind of the true, same yeah. thing. So I had a stint with trumpet. I knew a little trombone, but it was the slide, so I didn't learn that as well. Mm. But yeah, just amazing musicians to throw it back. No, and 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 Don would have gone further, but he was um he was found guilty of murdering his girlfriend, which is a which is a wild story. Like everything that I've read, he I think in this day and age, there's not a lot of, it's hard to doubt the mm -hmm. story, the, 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 the result. Mm -hmm. She was stabbed in the chest four times. And I think he was the only other person there. Mm -hmm. When they found him, he said, he, he said that he didn't do it. He, somebody else had done it, but he yeah. was found guilty. He went to jail and died like three, four years after that. Mm -hmm. So you have this really short time period of this guy with this group 
who was one of the create like the main creative forces and his stuff is still it ranks up there with a lot of other trombonists you could throw out and for a very odd and somewhat maligned instrument there's a lot of really good trombonists like mm. um who's it kevin eubanks brother the tonight show band leader his oh, brother yeah. robin is fantastic mm. I put Don Drummond up against him, and Kevin Eubanks, uh, Robin Eubanks, is ridiculously good. But it's it's one of those really it's a really interesting story, um, out of that first outgrowth of ska, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of something that people don't know about. It gets overlooked um, when there's been you know when people talk about Daryl Abbott, right? When you talk about musicians who died young that are really inspirational to people, like Dimebag Daryl. You talk to a certain sect of people, and they're like, oh, yeah, Don Drummond. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Don Drummond. One of those big ones, yeah. I wonder, uh, as Ska's waves propagated forward, like, did do you think that the musical complexity or some of the technicality of it got maybe, like, diluted? Or you know how, like, you get Ska core, you get core versions of something, right? Is it sort of that same mentality or that same idea? Um, it's interesting because the speed picked up, okay. right? Like you, especially on the punk side of it. Mm. Well, even, even before that, like a lot of second wave and two tone was faster. And I don't know if it was just because, well, you know, cars got faster and Everything speed of, <laughs> yeah, it's like the speed of speed information of life, sped yeah. up. So I think there was some of that to it. Like, there's two different versions of One Step Beyond. There's the Prince Buster version. Okay. That is kind of like, like that speed. Yeah. And then the Madness version is like. It's go it starts to get going, yeah. yeah. Right. But, I mean, the specials, like Ghost Town is not a, not a fast song. Gotcha. It's a very mellow song. I think when you got into the 90s, I don't know what happened, man. I don't know what <laughs> happened. When Scott got to the U.S. like proper, I don't know if like most of these third wave bands were just like i don't like were they snorting coke or were they <laughs> on speed or what and they were like we want to do this as fast as we can gotcha. because it kind of got there but there was also moon sky records out of new york that had um the not the slackers not the specials but like i think the toasters um Hepcat. Hepcat's really big. That was on Moon Ska. Um, and what, like, your range were, was this? They This was, like, early 90s. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of New York and Northeastern uh, groups formed around then. Mm -hmm. It was it was kind of a weird confluence where they weren't, um, like, the swing revival that lasted three, four years. Right. But Alex Dazer that was in Hepcat and was one of the main vocalists for that was in Swingers where they have that scene with um, John Favreau and Heather Graham and they're dancing to, um, why can't I think of that band? They did the theme song for Third Rock from the Sun, but they were like one of the main bands in the swing revival. So it was that kind of odd period where this musical style was coming back around again. And what those bands did on, they were mainly on the Moon Sky Records label was a lot of first wave and fairly mellow stuff, but it was, it even heavier, it was like almost like a cool jazz mm. version of it. It was <laughs> really even more influenced by that kind of West Coast Chet Baker style of jazz. And the first Hepcat record, good vocals, good musical um, composition, bad solos. Mm. It's funny. Huh. I love that record, but they would tell you like, oh yeah, these solos were pretty <laughs> elementary. <laughs> As they went on, I think they put out four or five albums. The second and third ones, you can tell they really worked on it. Mm -hmm. um, my favorites, I just saw them play. A, um, Jenna and I just went to see these guys because I was like, oh God, they left Long Island. I never thought they were gonna leave Long Island. Um, but they were playing all over the place in the early part of you know the 90s and the 2000s. And then they pretty much played like Long Island house shows. Mm. Um, but those guys, they were really technically sound. And they were playing some fast stuff, but they also played, uh, there's a version of Caravan that they have on their live album that's a little bit up-tempo. 
and they could lay it back when they wanted. It was just kind of more bombastic. And I don't know if that necessarily had to do with the time period too, like Gulf War. I, there's, there's a great quote on some YouTube video that I cannot remember. And it was a hip hop video, but mm. it was like, I'll never forget the 90s, drinking a St. Ives on the front porch, Bill Clinton getting dome in the White House with a banging economy. And I think there's just <laughs> this feeling in the mid 90s <laughs> that, that was similar in a way with de depending on where you were and what was going on like you're coming out of the 80s you're coming out of the me generation you're coming out of the crack ep epidemic and people are talking about it and some of these things are on the low where people's like hey this is this is where crack and coke came from but there's also this sense of not just i'm doing this for myself but also the sense of fuck it i'm i'm going for it and so I think that's a lot of what third wave Scott is or became, mm -hmm. where it was yeah. just like, there's a bit of yellow there, for, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 party time yeah. and like, yeah. undo it my it was way. Like, <laughs> skate culture was coming mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, Warp Tour dropped and Lala was still going and like early, early Lala Palooza. And it was just like, you know what? Well, and Warp Tour did a lot for that, that oh, yeah. part of it too. It was huge. Dude, some of those. You look back at some of those Warped Tour lineups, this is a little aside. Some of those early Warped Tour lineups had bands on the on the docket, depending on the city, that I don't think you would ever, ever, ever see on the same lineup together again. Oh, like, yeah. Big like, time. Like, NERD played, like, 2001 Warped Tour. And they are, yeah. it was like NERD and Less Than Jake and then something like My Chemical Romance. Or something, something I mean, that just makes no sense. The curation was like an early Lollapalooza where it was kind of just whatever the staffers wanted. Yeah, <laughs> it was wild. And then it turned more into the pop punk vehicle, yeah, yeah. which, like, I mean, coming back to ska, like all that ska stuff, pretty much directly started pop punk type music. Yeah, um, huge in Florida, huge in Chicago as well, which is like kind of indicative. Oh, and you know, you're right. It was so. I forgot about that. A lot of the bands came out of not just South Florida, but like I think Gainesville was yeah. the epicenter. Mm. Which <laughs> yeah, man. I, I had spent some time there with a bunch of those bands. Like I think I went to or like the art camp I worked at Mayday Parade. Two of those guys worked at the art camp. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. But like I remember seeing those yeah, people yeah, around yeah. Florida all the time, um, and then came here and I was like, oh, it's still here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I think there's just always a foundational element to it. It's not just people getting together with a bunch of horns and trying to play as loud as they can. Right, right, right. Totally. It always, there's a basis for it, and they're playing something that that is coming from here and here, and that they're kind of throwing out. Mm -hmm. When I go see um, uh, my my guy Chris's band is uh, Run and Punch. And so when I go see Run and Punch, it's very evident, in, well, in what they're singing about and, and what they're playing and how they're playing it, that they're trying to put something out there mm. that's within themselves. We're talking about passion and soul that's in them. Right. Even um, the, they put out a single a while back called Another Day, and it was like, I think it was like talking about a breakup, talking about job woes that are still very prevalent then as it is now, like five, six years ago when they came out with it. And that's the reality that we're in, right? Mm -hmm. Like the same as when they were mm -hmm. in the 50s, 60s, talking about, well, this is the reality we're in, the 70s, 80s, this is the reality we're in. In the 90s, it was not so much, but it was kind of contextual, this is the reality we're in, except for, well, I don't, I, I don't know if you could say that about I'm a dude from Good Burger, but <laughs> it's it, it would really be a good mm. theme right now because I'm a dude, she's a dude, we're all dudes. We yeah. are all yeah. dudes, yeah. you know? That, <laughs> that, if that yeah, ever that comes back, is, is like <laughs> that a, movie. A, a gender fluidity <laughs> anthem, dude, man. Good bird. It should, too, because that movie's great. Yeah. Uh, I love yeah. that movie. Yeah, I remember watching it as a kid. I had the orange VHS straight yep. from Nickelodeon. Yep. That VHS tough. was orange. And like <laughs> my brother and I thought that was the greatest thing. It Obviously, is. that movie cracked us up. I mean, it plays at time. the Logan Theater every once in a yeah. while. I saw it about a year ago with Craig. I think there's <laughs> I think there's a timelessness to that movie for Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's still Chicago, just as funny. Like he's still kicking yeah. around doing yeah. stuff. What yeah. uh how would you say that like Sky like 2023? Like 
things this year, think, or even last year, maybe. Yeah. Like, or what's now and what's yeah, the what, future? Yeah. What, what like what's vibing? Like what's hitting? At least with you. I mean, like like I said, I I love my friends. So Run and Punch is mm-hmm. still one of my favorites. Um, I like listening to them, even though I think they're they're not as much on the like on the ska punk cutting edge as they were when we were in high school, which makes sense. When you're in high school, you have that invincibility factor turned yeah. up to like twelve. Yeah. And you can dance all night. Now we're in our thirties and we can dance for maybe, you know, forty five minutes and then we have to take a break <laughs> and then come back to the floor. But I like run and punch a lot. Um and a lot of the bands that I mentioned before, like Streetlight Manifesto, are still putting good music okay. out. Yeah. But um it's it's for me, it's really I stick with the stuff I know. Okay. And some of that is just situational. Right. Like I don't mm-hmm. go to as many live shows or pull as many new new um, pull as much new music as mm-hmm. I did when I was young. Um, I mean, one guy I pay attention to who's newer is the Scott Tune Network person. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I forget the name of his actual band, but their last couple records I thought sounded great. And, there's a really interesting and, and sad case. Sorry to bring, keep bringing up the sad cases, but oh, no. there was a band out of New York, uh, the Frighteners, that put out one album, mm-hmm. and it's Frighteners with no E in the middle, and they are very much like um, kind of they fit into that late ska rocksteady reggae vein, but their album came out in twenty, I want to say twenty twelve or twenty fourteen, one of the two. Okay, but they. What happened was that they had to put it out and they were on a time frame because they found out that their lead singer had ALS. Mm -hmm. So there was only a certain amount of time that they could get everything in before his body started to fail. So they only put out the one album and then they said, we're not doing the Frighteners anymore. But this came up when I was listening to some other music that was like more old school and it just came up in the YouTube mix. And I was like, this is really, really good. And it's, it's a sad story because their lead vocalist voice is fan, absolutely fantastic. It's perfect for that kind of music. Man. And the way that they produced it elevated that as well as their band on the whole. So you're saying the Frighteners are an especially special kind of project. Yeah. yeah. I mean they were I mean they were, you know, they were trying to just kind of do what Hepcat did. You could see a, I could see a lot of Hepcat in them, not just because they're both from New York, mm. but they had a lot of early ska influence that sounded there was produced in a low fidelity kind of fashion but it didn't you knew it wasn't right, like, right. it was good it was tight it's it an was aesthetic very well choice produced. to that low finest right yeah right even yeah. their album cover had that that um look of it like check out that frighteners album mm. it's worth it it was really 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 worth it but yeah, also it's a good recommend too yeah it about, sounds like it, yeah Prince Buster is my favorite. Prince Buster is timeless. Prince mm-hmm. Buster is not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, the Scottalites still play at Reggie's every so often. It, yeah, I was going to say, they're still around and they still sound good. Yeah, the lineup changes, but they're still the Scottalites. So it's worth it. Like um, Desmond Decker's Shantytown, um, the Scottalites doing James Bond is... <laughs> Any, it was cool. like you could tell it was right in that wave of like cool um, Caribbean in the '60s, mm-hmm. like when Doctor No came out and they were in. I think they were literally either in Jamaica or the Dominican Republic. You could tell it was like okay, people want this is the music. That people right, right. Want, so, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's what's got it. So it is not. It is not some goofy like even the goofy stuff is not goofy, and I think the people who are still. Whether they're rude boys, rude girls, rude people or not, whether they dress that way or not, they'll still kick your ass. <laughs> so just if you're gonna crack jokes on Scott, I guess, you know, do it behind the safety of your keyboard. I mean, I think even just, you know, people taking a look at the history and then just going to a show, like like we said, it's such passionate music. It's hard to have yeah, a bad time. Yeah. yeah. I think even if you're not versed in either the technicality or the musicality of it, and even if you're not big on like the sound of it, like just being in a room full of people moving their bodies and feeling the music, that should be enough for most people to like, be like, this music makes some sort of sense to me. You get swept up yep. in it. Even but, like the pins and the buttons, mm-hmm. is always somebody, it's always like a guy or, or is like the guy with the sunglasses with his, with his feet up, 
or the girl in the dress with their feet up, mm-hmm. and you go with, to a show and that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And I like that because I, there's other music that I like and I'll go to shows for it, and it is a lot of like... A lot of head bobbing. Slow head nods. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like the slow head nod. Woo! Yeah! Music. And I'm yep. like, I can only... Got can't do that all I feel like yeah, yeah I think feel like what you're saying is like if you're gonna be there you're gonna be there 100 percent you want to move you want to feel you want to like sweat you want to like yeah, get it out you got to come yep, out of the show yep, yep if it's winter time you got to come out of the show knowing like okay don't catch a cold <laughs> yeah. like you gotta you gotta wipe this off and, yeah. and make sure you bundled up <laughs> <laughs> gotta get my 45 minutes in and I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> go outside take a break then go back in yeah. that's the whole point Awesome. Yeah, it's so fun. Well, Chris, uh, like we learned, I, I I personally learned a lot because I'm not, I, you know, I didn't come from the sky world and I don't dabble that much there. So like just talking to you about it and getting the insights, fantastic. It was everything you shared is so cool. And we're gonna have links in the description, of course, for bands mm-hmm. and recommendations and other kind of places to click around and learn more. And hopefully some music and some more recommends on the blogs. Yeah, so yeah. Check I'm gonna YouTube. check out the Frighteners. That that story is yeah, cool. It's cool. Cool. It sounds like one of those like flash in the pan albums. Like yeah, lightning in a bottle. Type it had thing. to happen. It happened. It was big, and then it unfortunately. I guess, yeah. You you listen to it, and I think immediately just like, what could have possibly happened had this not taken place? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because they seem primed to put out a lot more stuff. Wow. Man. Yeah. Well, smash it, like, and subscribe. Hit us up on the stuff. What he said. Yep. At Sound Sagas, <laughs> Facebook and Instagram. YouTube. If you're on, well, you're on YouTube. YouTube. But you might not be on YouTube. Sound Sagas TV. Sound, yeah. yeah. Um, what else we got? I think that's it. Oh. Got thank, you, thank you again, Chris. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It was wonderful. It. And check out some ska. Yep. Cheers to that. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hey, man. What you do? Yeah.